AI has, has been introduced. I'm a PhD student from the University of Duisburg Essen, and yeah, today I'm going to talk about our my our recent research about the energy efficient air steam accelerators on the FPJs, and we have some optimizations to make it more energy efficient. Uh, this one we have already been introduced by Professor already t yesterday, but um, I mean the guy that's focusing on the designing the components on the FPJ to make the AI accelerator more energy efficient. So very low level design stuff is what I'm doing. Um, before we start, I want to give you a little bit um, introduction about the LSTM. So LSTM is something like a mealy state machine that takes the current input plus the previous output to generate a new input. Yeah, this looks more confusing, but if you then look at this side, by unfolding it, then you could say that, okay, xt minus one is the input, the output from here, then plus the xt, then we can generate a new one. After several times of the iterations, then you can get the, then essentially we have a set of outputs, or we take the last one to do the further processing, or we output that directly. Uh, yeah, right now it looks like so simple that it's just a block, get the input, produce the output. But inside it, it's actually uh, more complex. You can roughly see that there are two data streams, like upside, bottom side, they are doing something. The upside basically represents the um, long-term memory, while the bottom side represents the short-term memory. In between, there are some interconnections. We call them gates. And they have nice names, forgetting gate, input, input gate, and output gate. The name stands for forgetting the stuff, for taking the useful stuff from the input, and uh, decide what to output. And the formulas on the other side, talking about that yeah, between the um, iterations, what kind of memory, uh, what kind of states we should update and how to update. It, yeah, there are more, more or less formulas, but this is something we want to put on the FPGA. Um, now let's look quickly at the one of the gate. It has, um, this part is the matrix multiplication. And uh, matrix multiplication plus some summation then do the um, activation is what we do for a gate. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see more detail of that. Um, yeah, we already implemented this LSTM cell a long time ago, like last year. But um, at that time, we saw that these three gates, they are independent to each other, so we make more parallelization of the gates. That's the gates to compute in parallel. Therefore, we have higher throughput and we achieved a good energy efficiency compared to the related work. Um, yeah, but there was a problem, actually. The problem is, uh, when we do that, we achieved only 100 megahertz for the clock frequency. While we know that when we do the um, what, neural network, deep learning neural networks like the multi-layer perceptions, like CNNs, we already achieved a much higher clock frequency. So there are something we want to still approve. The question is, how can we increase the usable clock frequency? Um, so we, we wanted to achieve something like in the past we achieved, like 200 megahertz or 300 megahertz, because we know this device is capable for that. So we, wa we wanted to know. Um, yeah, but from the other studies, we already know that um, we are doing something not uh, very compact. We only use 16 bits quantization, means we are using a very large number. And the other study says the lower the data the lower bit ways the data represents, maybe the high efficiency you can get or the low latency you can get, so you can use higher clock frequency. So what we tried is, we tried eight bits quantization at the beginning. We put that on the FPJ, we take the measure, but um, the improvement is like one megahertz higher. It's very little, so 
That's not a problem. The problem is not the data is too big. The problem is something else uh, obstacle our improvement. Um, yeah, but then if we look at the formulas, uh, I would not go to the detail, but you see the highlighted things are the activation functions, right? The sigmoid and the tangent function are both written here. Uh, the thing I want to draw the attention is the natural exponential function, which com computes that takes time, and if it's not accurate, then it uh, impacts the performance. So how do we optimize that? How do we put that on the FGJ? In the past, what we did is we used a lookup table. We used a very large lookup table to approx approximate that, and it's, we, we, we can notice the accuracy loss. It, lo uh, it loses accuracy, but it works. So uh, what can we do now? Uh, what else we can do to further optimize it? Uh, we checked the literature, and what we found is that um, there are hard 10 activation function, which is the alternative one for the 10 function. And it's just a piecewise function that has a linear, uh, a linear part, which is just output of the inputs, right? So it only needs to com compare the inputs with the two thresholds, like the max value and the minimum value, and they decided to say, okay, its output is one, the output is zero, or we just output the input. Since it's so simple, and the utilization only takes like five loops, which is very little because we have 10,000 of them on that FPGA. And if we, put the, if we use this hard 10 to train the model on PyTorch, then since, since we can implement the same thing on the FPJ exactly, then we can get the same performance or same accuracy on the software and on the hardware. I need to also mention that the mean value and the maximum value should be also using the, it should be also representable in fixed point data. Uh, yes. Then we talked about the uh, 10 functions and the sigmoid. Sigmoid is more problematic because, um, yeah, we can use hard sigmoid to replace it. But even if we replace it, there are still some problems here that the linear interval has the um, one divided by six, which is not representable by integer, by fixed point. So what we do is we use the, use the eight, replace six, divided by eight can be easily implemented by a bit shifting. So shift three times, then it's divided by eight, right? So it's efficient. And again, we can do the same thing as uh, training the module, training the module with the hard sigmoid star already on the PyTorch. So it means the model learns the accuracy loss during training. If the model converges or the accuracy you happy, then later on the hardware we don't lose anything anymore. Challenging. The challenge here is still we use x divided by eight. We sum sum the one divided by two again. This two has some dependencies. It has to execute sequentially, which could also cause the delay. We notice that, so we want to introduce more um, optimizations. The first one we, I mentioned, that's the arithmetic implementation. We just implement that in arithmetic, do the math. Then we think about that, okay, let's do the pre-computation. Means we, we, this one. We list all the possible input values of our fixed point. Uh, and then the hard sigmoid already said it's from minus three to three. Then we can list all of them, which is kind of 96 or 90, 97 entries. Then we also list all the outputs. We store all of them on the FPJ. Then during the long time, we only need to look at that, uh, just look at that and plop out the outputs, which is simple. And we hope, since all of them are parallel, right, on the FPJ with circuits, so they can run in parallel. It should be very fast. 
but it occupies that many entries. We, we think that it's not a good idea, especially you notice that the values outputs, the outputs are the same, right? So we are wasting some logics. So what do we do? If we look at the outputs from minus three to three, with eight, four as the quantization configuration, then we, we would only have 16 outputs. Then how about we just merge all the outputs, uh, merge, merge all the entries with the same outputs, then we build a step function. We hope with this, with this implementation, we might can get something like, okay, because we have less entries, we may consume very little resource. Since it's so lit, uh, it consumes so little resource, maybe it's much faster than the, the second one or even the first one, but we don't know. So we have to do some experiment to measure it. This experiment or these measures are taken from a tool called Vivadu and then we uh, do the synthesize, we do the simulation, we can measure the time and the resource utilization. The first row is something I wanted to focus first that with the 4.8 quantization configuration that then the, um, what, the root step was the most uh, win both on the delay. So the, the smaller the delay, the better, and the lowest resource utilization, the better. So it win on both. But if we keep the total bits doesn't change and we, keep, we change the fractional bits a little, like from four to six, you can already notice that the um, root one to one implementation wins on the um, delay and the resource, resource utilization already. We assume this is because merging the entries cause resource overhead, also cause logic overhead, and at some point it doesn't efficient anymore. That's why this happens. And if we keep increasing the bit ways to like eight to 10, then you could say, uh, the arithmetic one wins the utilization, while the one-to-one -one wins the speed. So both things could happen depends on the configuration. Therefore, we should keep both of them. We should keep all of them and make the user to choose one of them depends on what they want. Okay, but right now, like I said, we, we stick to 4.8 as the quantization configuration. And from the delay we measured, we estimated it's 3.66 nanoseconds. One divided by the delay means the clock frequency, which should be 220, uh, 270. However, if I put the both activation functions back to my design and check on the hardware, we can find some, op we can find some clock frequency improvements, but we only reached 100, 115 megahertz. So it's still little, it's not reaching 270s at all. There must be something else blocking my improvement. And yeah, there's another thing. In the STM cell, that's the, another computation, as I mentioned, is the matrix multiplication. We are using fixed point, uh, and as the, to make me easier to explain it, I use this algorithm to describe what we did for, to achieve the fixed point multiplication, or accumulation. And then what we did here, what we did is you needed to see that we have something called a one iteration. This means two numbers multiply together and do the accumulation. Includes step three to step seven, right? But Step three, uh, these steps must be executed sequentially, right? You cannot do one, uh, you, you cannot do them at the meantime. It must be happened one after each other. And we, we measured the time, I measured the time that I, I, can, I can know that executing these four steps takes eight nanoseconds. Eight nanoseconds leads to 120 megahertz around that, 25 megahertz. So, this is the reason why it's so slow, why it cannot be higher. Uh, so we needed to somehow shorter this time or improve this patch, but you know we cannot really shorten the time 
because it takes time. What we do, we can use a pipeline. Pipeline means that you can see S1, S2, S3, S4 are still executed, executed sequentially for one iteration. But if you look at different iterations, you could say they are executing parallelly. Means we are breaking the uh, most delayed part into small pieces. Now we can, we can, we can parallelize them a little bit. So they are not, they, for one iteration, they are still execute, executed sequentially, but in reality, they are really parallelized. So the longest delay was bro, bro, breaking up, and now we, if we assume these three steps consume the same amount of the time, then we could achieve three times higher clock frequency because we break, break it. But um, you could also notice that there are some some overhead of entering it, quitting it, these parts are not parallelized at all, right? Here and there. So how much can we speed up? It depends on the length of the vector. So I plot out the trend of the improvements. Uh, yeah, then you could say that the upper bound is three times faster. And here are something like one point something, I mean, close to zero, of course, no improvement, but we would not do zero. And I can tell you, the 20 hidden size is kind of, uh, the length of the vector, if it's 20 is quite small for the STM, or it's quite normal. So we normally take this one, then it's already 2.5. So in theory, we could achieve 2.5 more clock frequency, means two, from 100 megahertz to 250. Is that true? Um, yeah, that's something later I will pop up, I guess. Um, then, okay, we have, um, oh yeah, I'm, I forgot one thing. So when we add the pipeline back, so now we have the pipeline. So the delay is shortened. Then we realize something very interesting that on the FPGA, we would prefer to use DSP to make it faster enough. But when we break the pipeline, then we can use loots to do the computation because now the delay of that thing, the mass happens, are break into three steps, so it's not critical anymore. So we can use LUTs, and most importantly is we don't have that many DSPs. So using LUTs is a good idea at some point. Um, therefore, we proposed a parameterized architecture, so we have the flexibility to choose, for example, what, what resource applied for LUTs. Do we use lookup tables? Do we use DSPs? Uh, what implementation of hard signal model star we use? Or what's the slope for the hard 10? Or you also see that blocks are highlighted with yellow. They are the resource that's utilized for store the weights because the weights are occupy small memory, like huge memory. I, I think the next page will show you more. Yes. We have the parameterized architecture. We want to know if it really works, if it's capable for different application scenarios. The 20, I hope you still remember the 20. The 20 means um, the experiment we did in the past or we found on the related work set we can compare with, that's our begin point. And if we first look just at this side, you could see something that, um, let me quick check. The yellow line is the DSP utilization, but we choose all the alus without DSPs, means zero. And we have a, a static overhead of this green line, which is the loots. The loots used for instantiate the alu, instantiate the, um, in, I, I think it's just for alu and some connections. And the blue line is more significant, right? But this is just for storing the weight. Means weights are more critical to be stored on the memory, on the FPJ. We have a very small FPJ, and here you could see that it already reaches 100, right? And the block RAM is called block RAM because it, you have to use it block by block. That's why it's a step function, looks like, it has steps. At this point, we run out of block RAM. We are not we don't have enough resource anymore. 
what happens is our architecture enable, is capable to enable the roots to store some part of the weights. That's why you see it arise. And the block RAM utilization at this point drops. And of course, if we utilize the DSP for the ALUS, then um, the utilization for the loots would be dropped a little bit because then the ALU was be used with DSPs, not loots anymore. That's the fact. Um, yes, then we, uh, then we can compare with the related work with most importantly is the L3. This one is we have done two years ago, or oh, one year ago. Um, there are these two, since this, two, this L3 and our, this work is both implemented by us, so we, ha we can do a fair comparison. And you could see that at the beginning it was 100 megahertz, and this time we achieved 204 megahertz. So the clock frequency improved. So clock frequency improves means it, it's faster. It would also consume more energy or maybe not. Yeah, you could see it even not consuming more energy because we're using lower bits. That's why it happens. But uh, yeah, again, in general, we get faster speed, we consume lower energy. That's why our, this work was performing much higher energy efficient than previous work, than our previous work. And the other interesting fact is that the, um, the um, using DSP or not using DSP, that using DSP would help us to save some dynamic power, means it's, it saves power, but the problem is we only have 20 DSPs, so it depends. If it's enough, use DSP. If it's not enough, don't use it. And then, uh, there are another two related works very close to ours. They also doing LSTM accelerators on embedded device or embedded FPJs. Um, that's why I list both of them here. The L1, they use um, a very large FPGA, so it has a very big static power, okay, and the, they are running very, at a low clock frequency, right? 50 megahertz is slower than ours. That's why the energy efficiency is so poor. The second one, they use a small FPJ, which has the benefits of zero static power. That's the improvement, or oh, good choice. And they have, some, um, they have some improvement of the throughput. So this is larger, the energy uh, power consumption is lower, that's why their energy efficiency is already higher than the previous one. For us, we have a drawback of which is the FPJ has static power. So it becomes difficult. We made our effort of improve the throughput, improve the clock frequency. That's why we can essentially achieve some higher energy efficiency. Now then conclude our work. Yes, this time we proposed some, some optimizations for the activation functions. We also have to pipeline the ALU to increase the throughput a little bit more. And yes, we used an parameterized architecture as the system-wise optimization to help us to um, extend the flexibility. And on this Spartan 7 FPJ, we achieved 29% roots and 30% of root RAM reduction. So our design now is smaller, but more efficient uh, yeah, in power because now it will reduce about 18% 80, 80, of power reduction, right? And the clock frequency is faster, two times more energy efficiency. In the future, so all this thing happened by what I did from now or struggled till now can be automated by integrating this work to the tool chain, as we mentioned yesterday, the creator. A deep learning developer only needed to click a button, then the training and the deployment to the FPGA can be finished. So they don't need to do it again. Another thing we want to explore is the scalability of this architecture to check how can we change the parameters to adapt to different applications. Um, Yes, my talk is finished. I'm open, open for questions.
Um, yeah. Can you go to the slide where you explain the uh, hard sigmoid asterisk uh, function? Yeah. Uh, this. <laughs> yeah, this one. Hard uh, why was the reason to, I mean, I know that one six is not a representable in fixed point that you said here, but when you change to uh, the eight here, uh, the function is not continuous. I mean, in three and in minus three. Isn't that an issue for for the model? Uh, okay, first of all, it's always in continuous because it's digital numbers, right? Mm -hmm. It's always not continuous. Uh, I guess what you were asking is, what what could be the consequence of replace six by eight, right? Uh, oh. Yes, it has some consequence. It might suffer for training, but it's okay because. Um, we train the model randomly with random gradient descent. As soon as it converges, then we use it. Otherwise, we train it many, uh, several times again, right? So that's, that's the reason. So it's okay. And uh, in other related works, the slope, the slope is not always six. They use different numbers, like 0 0.1 or 2 point something. They change that on different studies. Means it's actually fine to use different numbers. Yeah. I hope that's ask answer yeah, yeah. your question. Well, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Notwithstanding with your presentation, I would like to ask you about very just recent uh, discoveries by South Korean scientists. I mean, superconductivity. Well, this, if superconductivity will be confirmed in many laboratories, for example, a lab in China confirmed a superconductor's uh, effect, on superconductor, superconductor effect, uh, but then your the energy efficient LCTMs may be 10 times or 20 times more efficient. What do you think about that and in, in confirmation with the relation of your discoveries? Oh, that's... Um, well, I'm keeping following this thing happens, like, right? The Chinese guys are repeating the experiments, yes? Well, if there's no resistance, if there's no waste of energy for computing, of course, we don't need that anymore. But it won't happen, or it would not apply in reality in several years, right? And my technology can be used now, from now on. That's a point, I think. <laughs> then, thank you.